Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery with you again, part three this time, presenting the soon-to-be acclaimed CHP overview of the life of China's premier, Zhou Enlai. We left off last time, you may recall, with the evacuation of Rei Jin. That was the place back in 1930 where Mao had established his Jiangxi Soviet. The communists at the time of the evacuation had taken absolute beating at the hands of Chiang Kai-shek's NRA. First came the Shanghai Massacre, April 12, 1927, and the subsequent White Terror. Then four years later came the Gushun Zhang Affair and the capture and interrogation of Xiang Zhongfa. All these things combined to drive the CCP deep, deep underground. When the whip came down, there was nowhere else to go except to Mao Zedong's relative safe haven in Beijing. So the whole party center, 28 Bolsheviks and all, fled from Shanghai south in the direction of Beijing. Suddenly, these guys like Bo Gu, Zhou Enlai, and others show up. You have to be wondering what Mao must have been thinking at this point. He was this loose cannon, sort of. He hardly ever got any respect from the party center or the common turn. Now they barge in on his turf that he had gone to great lengths to hold on to, and suddenly they're in charge? No sooner was this Jiangxi Soviet established when Jiang began a series of encirclement campaigns to shut it down from about November 1930 till March 1933. Jiang launched four of these campaigns, but each time the Communist Red Army, led brilliantly by Zhu De, Mao, Zhou, and others, repelled the attacks. Jiang finally got them on the fifth try, and in October 1934, they evacuated Beijing, breaking through these blockhouses, and finally, in mid-December, made their way just over the Guizhou border to the city of Liping. In the two months since the evacuation of Beijing, meticulously planned by Zhou Enlai, the communists had become a mere shell of their former selves. Tempers were flaring between these Opposing factions, accusations were flying, and the leadership was shell-shocked at what had just happened. It was Mao Zedong who came up with the only feasible short-term plan, to head northwest to the city of Zunyi, second-largest city in Guizhou province, after Guiyang, of course. They arrived on the outskirts of Zunyi, New Year's Day, 1935. The nationalist garrison there gave up without much of a fight. This is where they were able to put down their rucksack, sit down, and try and figure out what the heck just happened. The good old days of 1924-25 seemed like a hundred years ago. Now look at them. All those who had managed to survive the relentless pressure of Jiang's military police, army, and all manners of anti-communist leaning countrymen they encountered along the way, gathered in Sunyi to come to a consensus about what to do next. This moment in history is forever known as the Zunyi Huiyi, the Zunyi Conference, held on January 15 to 17 at an old warlord's mansion at number 80 Hongqi Road. The CCP kept this meeting secret for a very long time. It's popularly called the meeting where Mao became the top guy in the CCP. Actually, this isn't true. When it was all over and they pulled out of town, Mao didn't have the titles yet to back him up, but after Zunyi... Everyone more or less began to defer to his leadership. The Comintern and later their 28 Bolsheviks had done well keeping Mao bottled up and away from the levers and knobs controlled by the party center. Now he was inside that circle. The Comintern's proxies, that is, Stalin's proxies, ended up getting marginalized. The 28 Bolsheviks had all met in Russia and had been fully indoctrinated with the latest in Soviet propaganda. They were sent back to China like a bunch of Manchurian candidates with Stalin's backing to take over the CCP and on a very simple level, do whatever Stalin wanted them to do. The major upshot of the Zunyi conference was that these 28 Bolsheviks, and therefore the common turn too, got pushed aside. And by the time we get to the end of this episode, Mao's going to deal with them once and for all. So, Zhou Enlai, where did he fit in? He was the one who called this whole Tsunyi conference of the extended Politburo. 20 people, although even that figure is disputed. It was Joe's idea to gather together the entire Politburo, including alternates, and discuss the events of the past 60 days and to learn from these mistakes. 
The topmost leadership included Boku, Otto Brown, and Zhou Enlai. These were the guys in charge who had called all the shots since arriving at Reijin. They had to speak first at the meeting to offer their reasons why they got mauled like they did. Boku and Otto Brown, well, they blamed everything and everyone except themselves. They offered up a bunch of excuses that were all valid to one degree or another. The KMT armies were too strong and well-equipped. The communist communications network was too degraded. They had a whole litany of excuses. But when it came time for Zhou Enlai to speak, he blamed no one except the leadership for their incorrect planning and decisions. They were in this situation because of mistakes committed militarily and politically by the ones who were in charge of this whole Reijin evacuation. And when Zhou Enlai said the leadership, he meant himself, Bo Gu and Brown. Well, this sure shook things up. Bo Gu and Otto Brown were saying, hey, don't look at us. What were we supposed to do? But Zhou Enlai, with all the dignity and fearlessness he could muster, just leaned on his sword and fell on it. He was the only one who had the guts to say, nobody's fault but mine. With Joe's admission that it was the leadership's fault, it became open season to take as many shots as anyone wanted at the 28 Bolsheviks. At once, the fingers started pointing like crazy. Mao blasted Baugh and Brown. He gave it to them good. Brown, by the way, did not speak Mandarin, or Mao's Hunan dialect either, so you can imagine how he felt getting roasted alive in this conference and being entirely dependent on his translator to make his arguments. Mao also criticized Wang Ming, who was up in Moscow all along, for his decisions as well. When it was all over, the 28 Bolsheviks and their top two, Boku and Otto Brown, had to take a back seat. They weren't in charge anymore. There were three main defections from the 28 Bolsheviks, Zhang Wentian, Wang Jiaxiang, and Yang Shangkun. Zhang Wentian turned on his comrades, Bo and Brown. He delivered a scathing criticism of their tactics and handling of the situation. This opened the door for Mao to chime in and attack them directly as well. And Zhou selflessly heaped as much blame as possible on himself and pointed at Mao. And he said all along, at every juncture, Mao was dissed by everyone, and it turns out we should have listened to him. Zhou even went as far as to step down as the top person militarily and said it should be Mao Zedong who should be in charge of the military in the way it was with communism. Whoever was the top guy militarily, he was capo de capo with the whole thing. Zhou said up till now all the military strategy had been wrong. As far as the propaganda and political aspect of everything, that too had been ignored. Zhou's admission of error changed the whole tone of things. And when Zhou and Lai said that Mao Zedong should be the one we should be following, one by one, everyone lined up behind them. But Zhou also came in for a fair amount of criticism as well. He didn't walk away from the Sun Yi conference unscathed. Mao gave him an airfall. Even though Zhou seemed to be clearing the way for Mao's ascendance to the top, the way it worked, Mao had to whack Zhou too. But he did it with the flat of his sword rather than driving it in deep. Zhou put himself completely at the mercy of Mao. One of the things Mao criticized Zhou for was the evacuation of Rei Jin. When they left, Zhou had called for everything to be packed up and taken wherever it was they were going next. That included all the printing presses, heavy equipment, and all kinds of things that were guaranteed to slow down an army on the run. And that's exactly what happened. Time and again, for the sake of Saving this equipment, lives were lost and their retreat was slowed. Mao gave it to Joe good for this idea. When all was said and done, the final conclusion was that the leadership of Bo, Brown, and Joe were responsible for the mistakes. But Bo and Brown were chiefly responsible. After all, hadn't Joe and Lai said before at the Ningdu conference in early October 1932 that the tactics of Bo and Brown were not effective? Therefore, that was it for them. They were out. Joe, however, remained part of the new leadership. He was demoted, but not out. His shift towards Mao's direction was already underway by Sun Yi. Boku and Brown had fought Mao up to the end. Mao did not get the top spot in the party that Joe had called for him to get. Putting Mao in place of Boku was too big a step after all that had just happened. 
As a compromise, they gave the party secretary spot to the former 28 Bolshevik, Zhang Wen-Tian. Joe replaced Otto Brown as top military man. Mao was his number two. Mao, however, was given one of the coveted spots on the Politburo Standing Committee. Though Joe was the head of the military, he deferred to Mao in these matters. He knew Mao was better suited to make these decisions. Zhang Wen-Tian was also loyal to Mao, so in both political and military affairs, he had Joe and Zhang Wen-Tian as his puppets, so to speak. At this moment in Chinese history, Joe took his life and put it in Mao's hands to do as he wanted. After Joe made such a self-effacing self-criticism and said, you know, I am to blame, at that point, Mao could have just gone in for the final kill. Joe had always been a rival of Mao's all these years. Joe had never tried to grab top power, but he did stand in Mao's way. So Mao went after Bo Gu and Otto Brown. When Mao began ranting on Zhou and Sun Yi, it was all for show. The official minutes from the Sun Yi conference, written down by Deng Xiaoping, are one of those top-secret, hidden-from-public-view kinds of documents. The historical record makes it pretty clear that at this point, although not the top guy on paper, if he hadn't bought your Mao Zedong shares yet, you better call your broker fast. After Sun Yi, there was this inevitability that this one-time... Long shot from Hunan was going to turn into the top leader of the party. In March, a three-man group was put together that had Zhou, Mao, and Wang Jiaxiang. Wang was in charge of party affairs, and Zhou and Mao oversaw military affairs. Well, China is big, but not so big that Jiang Kai-shek didn't find out the whole CCP was chilling in Zun Yi. As soon as he started to send his armies in that direction, it was time to pack up and get moving. And thus began the long march. Mao determined the general strategy, and Zhou handled all the details, of which there were quite a few. Each night, Zhou, Mao, and Zhang Wentian would meet to discuss what to do the next day, and it was always left up to Zhou to write it all out, get the word out to the last man. Here's where Mao and Zhou developed their working relationship. Mao gave the broad strokes and general direction. Zhou understood what Mao wanted, and would offer his wise counsel. Then after Mao's decision was made, he knew how to make these things happen throughout the system. I don't want to rehash the long march here. It was the whole matter of Zhang Guotao and his big beefy fourth front army, 84,000 strong, to deal with yet. Like the Odyssey that had all these challenges along the way, it was the same with the long march. There were two crucial meetings that took place in northwest Sichuan. First in June at Lianghekou, and two months later in Mao Argai. A lot of heated arguments back and forth. After he rendezvoused with his much bigger army, Zhang Guotao was in a very enviable position and had Mao back on his heels. Zhou stood on Mao's side and sticking with what was decided at Sun Yi. Zhang Guotao had a bit of a swagger going on in the summer of 1935. His army hadn't been shredded yet. So, while he had the superior position militarily, he tried to assert his authority. And his viewpoint was that all the decisions made in Sun Yi were null and void. And we all know, in the end, Zhang Guotao went south and Mao went north. These two rivals wouldn't meet up again until December 1936 up in Yan'an. And we know from previous episodes, by then, Chan Kuo Ta won't be looking so good. And by 1937, he'll be purged from the party. And the next year, he defected to the KMT. And in 1968, he will emigrate to Canada, where he died in 1979, outliving his rival by three years. So to keep up appearances, Zhou was the top military man and Mao was under him. But right after they got set up in Yan An, Zhou stepped down and Mao became number one. And that's how it stayed until the bitter end. Mao first, Zhou second. Zhou and Lai bore the brunt of the entire long march in not the best of shape. He was not a well man a lot of the time, suffering from all manners of debilitating ailments, especially when Zhang Guotao showed up, and after the crossing of the Datu River in late May 1935, Zhou got deathly ill. And there weren't any hospitals along the route of the Long March. He couldn't even walk. I'll tell you a quick story. During this time when Joe was really in a bad way, just as they were passing through the most horrible part of the ordeal, 
through the grasslands where Sichuan, Tibet, and Qinghai all come together. One of the men who bore Joe's stretcher was Yang Li San. He was one of the officers in charge of logistics and supply. The logistics and supply division was later known as the Zhong Ho Qin Bu of the PLA. Anyway, when Yang Li San passed away in 1954, well, he wasn't what you'd call a top leader. He had a brilliant record fighting the Japanese and the nationalists, but he was really only the PLA General Logistics Department Minister and later the National Food Industry Minister. But nevertheless, when he died, Zhou Enlai, already the premier of China, helped carry Yang's coffin at the funeral in remembrance of what Yang had done for Zhou back in late August 1935 during the harshest days of the Long March. A lot of people on hand to witness this moment who walked the Long March probably understood the significance. There was a person who kept Zhou alive through each ordeal. His name was Fu Lianzhang. He's better remembered as Nelson Fu. He made the whole long march with everyone else. Nelson Fu later became the doctor to the Zhongnanhai elites and a vice minister of public health. He wound up on the wrong side of Lin Biao during the Cultural Revolution and died in prison in 1968. Anyway, without the care of Nelson Fu, Fu Lianzhang, it's doubtful Zhou Enlai would have survived the worst of his illnesses during the long march. Nelson Fu was one of the many unsung heroes of the 1930s and 40s. Well, 3,000 miles after they left Beijing, they made it to Yan'an in October 1935. By November of that year, Mao officially outranked Zhou Enlai in the military. Zhou recovered from the ordeal, and he set up a home in one of the caves with Deng Ying Chao. Throughout 1936, there were a lot of late-night meetings. There were still 13 years to go yet before the PRC will be established, but... It was never too early to start planning. 1936 saw the Berlin Summer Olympics that year and the formation of the Berlin-Rome Axis. Stalin knew it wouldn't be long before Japan would join these Axis powers. 1936 was also the year Stalin launched his great purge. A thousand executions per day. That went on for a couple of years or so. Anyway, Chiang Kai-shek knew the whole CCP party center was in and around Yan'an. He had two armies to deal with them. He had the Northwest Army under Yang Hucheng and the Northeast Army, the Dong Beijun, under the command of the young marshal, Zhang Xueliang. They called him the young marshal, or Shao Shi, because in 1936, he was all of 35 years old, commanding one of the great warlord armies of all time. His father, of course, was Zhang Zolin. The Japanese military machine couldn't buy Chang Zolin off or bring him over to their side, so they blew up his train in 1928 with him in it. They thought they'd have better luck manipulating the warlord's former opium-smoking, no-good son. Jiu Yiba, September 18, 1931, the Mukden incident. Japan used some pretext to seize control of Manchuria. This marked the beginning of their gradual control of China's industrial, trading, and transportation heartland. Zhang Xueliang wasn't big enough or strong enough to take on Japan yet, so he allowed his Northeast Army to be pushed out of their base. After Zhou Yiba came the Battle of Shanghai, 1932, when boycotts and protests against Japanese became so violent that Japan began bombing the place. The following year, Japan withdrew from the League of Nations. 1934 saw Pu Yi, the last emperor, get a second chance at greatness. He was just an infant when the Empress Dowager thrust him on the dragon throne. Now he was all grown up, and Japan made him the emperor of Manchukuo. The Japanese in Manchuria thought they'd have an easier time with Zhang Xueliang, but he proved to be no more willing to cooperate with them than his father was. All this Japanese encroachment in China didn't appear to be a big deal for Chiang Kai-shek. His priorities were wiping out the surviving CCP remnants in Yan'an. Both Yang Hu-chong and Zhang Xueliang had been given this order. They complied at first, but after a while, there wasn't much to show for their efforts. The whole thing seemed futile. Japan was just smashing and grabbing whatever they wanted in China, and here they were fighting these battles against fellow Chinese. It just didn't seem right. So the young marshal, Zhang Xueliang and Yang Hu-chong, quickly lost faith in their leader. Sensing they might be people he could reason with, 
it was around this time that Joe and Lai reached out to them. Not long after they began to get set up in Yan'an, Joe sent out feelers to Yang Hucheng. Once this was established, contact was also made with Zhang Xueliang. Joe met with the young marshal for five hours on April 6, 1936. These three men, Zhou Enlai, Zhang Xueliang, and Yang Hucheng, aside from a common dislike and mistrust of Jiang Kai-shek, they all believed the focus of every effort should be in resisting the Japanese rather than the whole Civil War thing. It was 1936. It had been 10 years since the Zhongshan gunboat incident, and Jiang was still trying to get rid of the communists. The Shanghai Massacre, the White Terror, the Secret Police, the Five Encirclement Campaigns, harassing them when they were on the run during the Long March. How hard he had tried. And now he almost had them. He only needed his two generals up there, Yang Hucheng leading the Northwest Army and Zhang Xueliang in the Northeast, to combine together and put an end to them finally. They were all in one place in northern Shanxi, but what Jiang didn't know was that Zhou Enlai had already gotten through to them. Zhou had convinced them to join together with the Red Army and unite to fight the Japanese. And he further convinced them to do their best to persuade Jiang to see things this way, and that they had no problem with Jiang being the one in charge. Well, Jiang had tasked these guys with stamping out the Red Army, but nothing seemed to be going on. So he decided to take matters into his own hands and lead the fight himself. He ordered one of his armies north, and then he flew up to Xi'an and set up a northwest headquarters for the suppression of bandits and prepared for the final battle. Well, I don't want to get into the minutia of the Xi'an incident, but this event, like the Long March, Zhou Enlai got a producer credit. Since Zhou Enlai's April meeting with Zhang Xueliang in an abandoned Catholic church in Yan'an, Zhou proposed to the young marshal that Jiang Kai-shek stop trying to annihilate them and join together to form a government of national defense to fight against Japan. They acknowledged Jiang's supremacy in this grave moment in the nation's history, and they agreed to fight under his banner. Joe knew all the CCP really needed was a seat at the table. When Jiang argued to Jiang Kai-shek to consider this proposal, Jiang thought, Are you kidding or something? What part of destroy them don't you understand? But Jiang Xueliang and Yang Hucheng didn't go after the communists. Instead, they trained together with them and came to an agreement to focus their efforts on pushing back on Japan. The communist propaganda machine was operating at full throttle to get the word out far and wide that all their efforts were focused on resisting Japan. Zhou Enlai had set up a news agency called Xinhua in 1936 to act as the mouthpiece of the party. It still is, 80 years later. At a time when the visceral hatred of Japan was reaching a boiling point, Joe was effective in getting the word out nationally that they, the communists, were going to lead this effort against Japan. And if no one else would do it, they would. This was the tone of the propaganda throughout 1936. Joe had even gone so far as to write directly to Chiang Kai-shek. This was in September. He had said to Jiang in the 10 years since they last met, Japan had gone and taken over five provinces of China. He appealed to Jiang's sense of patriotism and love of China, but all to no avail, despite all the pressure bearing down on Jiang to reverse his strategy of dealing with the Communist Red Army first and Japan later. It all came to naught. His mind was pretty well set. The Communists had to go. Anyway, Joe never got a reply from Jiang. In the meantime, throughout all of 1936, Stalin, via the Comintern, was calling for a united front with Jiang against Japan. The late-night planning sessions in Yan'an were no doubt quite intense. This represented a huge chance for the CCP politically. If they could get a seat at the table, it would represent a massive comeback. But Jiang wasn't having any of it. He flew up to Xi'an in September, around the time Joe was writing to him, trying to get him to back down on his efforts to exterminate the CCP and join together to fight Japan. Once he was face-to-face with Zhang and Yang, he ripped them a new you-know-what. 
He made all kinds of threats, hints, and remarks that let it be known he wasn't happy with their performance in wiping out the communist army. After conferring with his other army in Luoyang, Jiang let it be known he had lost faith in the northwest and northeast armies of Yang and Zhang. If they wouldn't do the job, he would. Jiang returned to Xi'an on December 4th, 1936, when Zhang Xueliang met with Jiang and tearfully tried to reason with him. Jiang said bitterly, quote, You've been influenced by the Reds, no doubt Zhou Enlai, the man of a thousand different tunes. I tell you that even if I were to die tomorrow, I would first suppress the communists, end quote. Five days later, there were organized student protests in Xi'an, demanding the government do something to fight back against Japan. The horrors committed by the Japanese army of December 1937 were still a year away, but the national mood was decidedly in favor of fighting back. Jiang kept assuring everyone that this fight with the Red Army was in its last five minutes. They were almost done. Then they'd go after the Japanese. If you listen to the CCP version of events, they claim they didn't know what the young marshal and Yang Hu Chung were up to, but that's doubtful. Anyway, at 4 a.m. on December 12th, the Xi'an incident was just beginning to unfold. Jiang was scheduled to depart that day. The first order of business was for the conspirators to seize KMT political and communications channels. At 5 a.m., Jiang was already up and at him doing his morning exercises. He heard things and suddenly knew something was up, and it wasn't good for him. As the famous story goes, Jiang Kai-shek was led by one of his aides out the back window and tried to hide on the compound of the Hua Qing Resort where he was staying. But four hours later, he was found and escorted to Yang Hu Cheng's headquarters. Mid-December in Xi'an is not what you call balmy. It was freezing cold when all this was going down. And during the attempted escape, Jiang's choppers fell out and couldn't be found. He was a mess. So Jiang was officially kidnapped and being held while communications were sent out to both the nationalist government in Nanjing and to the communists. An eight-point plan was announced pretty much written up by Zhou Enlai, that called for everyone to join together in this dark hour to fight back against the invading Japanese forces. Stalin almost had a heart attack when he heard what was going on. Nothing could have been worse than this. You see, Russia was very nervous about having the Japanese so close to their borders. With Germany and Italy making all this noise in the West and then cozying up with Japan, Stalin was feeling like he was getting squeezed He had his mind fixed on one thing, tying down Japan in China and taking Japan's mind and military resources away from any thoughts of encroaching on Russian territory or interfering with Russian operations in China. Once Zhou found out what had happened, assuming he didn't know that Zhang and Yang were going to take such drastic action, he took control of the situation. The most immediate problem had to do with Chiang Kai-shek's fate. First of all, The Generalissimo, in this kind of situation, was not an easy person to handle. Yang and Zhang had more than a handful, and as soon as they discovered Jiang was not going to give in to them, they called in Zhou and Lai to help save the day. But Jiang refused to see Zhou. No way that was going to happen. That was too sensitive a thing, especially under these circumstances. So as Jiang Kai-shek remained captive in the Palace of Glorious Purity in Xi'an, no doubt with the ghosts of Tang Xuanzong and Yang Guifei to keep him company, it became Zhou's role to work with Jiang Xueliang and Yang Hucheng to decide what to do. There were two opposing sides with differing opinions on what to do with the Generalissimo. One group said, execute him. The other side wanted him alive. Zhou's position was that They needed to keep Jiang alive. Zhou and others felt that at such a delicate time as this, the last thing China needed was a national political crisis that would help make Japan's job much easier to finish. H.H. Kong heard first about what had happened, and he notified Song Mei Ling at once. Song Mei Ling and Zhang Xueliang had a common friend in the Australian William H. Donald. W.H. Donald had become a mentor and close friend of Jiang Xueliang. It was Madame Jiang's hope that he could talk some sense into the young marshal. Zhou Enlai's eight points of national salvation were proffered to the authorities in Nanjing via the two generals. Stalin had strongly ordered Mao 
not to do anything rash and to work out a solution. Joe got sent to Xi'an to make sure this happened. From this point forward, it was Zhou Enlai who took over all the choreography of the Xi'an incident. Although he hadn't been able to meet Jiang face-to-face, Joe was calling all the shots. Jiang Kai-shek knew this point very well. Joe negotiated with Jiang through TV Song, Madame Jiang's brother. Joe agreed the fight against Japan would best be led by Jiang. He said although the Red Army fought under Jiang's banner, they themselves would retain actual control over their army. Mao wasn't yielding on this point. When resistance was given against this matter of control, Joe reminded TV Song that warlord armies and generals who were not entirely loyal to Jiang were being used, so the precedent was already there for the CCP to retain control over their army, even though they fought under Jiang's banner. When the negotiations reached their final stages, that's when Joe called on Jiang. He went together with TV Song and saluted Jiang when he saw him, 8 in the morning, December 24th. This had been the first time the two had met face-to-face since the Zhongshan gunboat incident. A lot of blood had been spilled since then. In so many words, in exchange for releasing Jiang unharmed and acknowledging Jiang's leadership, he agreed to form a national united front and cease hostilities against the CCP forces. Jiang also agreed that the CCP could send representatives to Nanjing to liaise with the KMT government there. And almost as an aside, Zhou mentioned to Jiang that his son, Jiang Jingguo, would be coming back to China soon. For many years, Stalin had ordered that Jiang Jingguo be held against his will in Moscow as a political hostage. The Generalissimo had tried to get his son back, but any attempts had led nowhere. Yet here was Zhou Enlai telling Jiang eh, his son would be coming home soon. And indeed, in April the following year, the bloody year of 1937, Jiang Jingguo returned. No agreement was signed. Zhou took Jiang for his word. In a private meeting later on when Zhou was alone with TV Song and Song Mei Ling, they asked him how they could get in touch with him in Shanghai. He told them they could always find him through their sister, Song Qingling. He let them know their patriotic sister had already written a check for $50,000 to Mao. Later on, Song Qingling will let it be known that she didn't appreciate that Zhou let that one slip. Therefore, on Christmas Day, 1936, Jiang left Xi'an with his entourage. Jiang Xueliang, as an act of good faith, accompanied Jiang to Nanjing. As an act of bad faith, Jiang had the young marshal arrested, charged, pardoned, and kept under house arrest until the day Jiang died in 1975. Afterwards, Jiang Xueliang moved to Honolulu and lived out the rest of his days, dying in 2001 at the age of 100. Zhang Xueliang's first place of incarceration was in the town of Shiko, outside of Ningbo. I visited it once. Jiang also had a residence there as well. Yang Hucheng did not fare so well. After believing he was in the clear for a while, he ended up imprisoned, thrown in a concentration camp, and later in 1949, before Jiang picked up and left for Taiwan, he had Yang executed. Zhou Enlai, perhaps more than anyone else in on the negotiations, was responsible for Jiang flying out of Xi'an that Christmas day in 1936. After all the past failures, it really seemed he had them at last. Everything was in place that could have wiped out the communist armies or at least forced them deeper into the north, into Mongolia even. But this kidnap and the aftermath, and particularly the role Zhou played, changed everything, certainly the course of Chinese history. Okay, another united front. This time the nation was fighting to defend itself from an enemy without rather than from warlords from within. But despite all that well-meaning talk, in the end, powerful conservatives in the KMT said they just couldn't do it. But just like Zhou expected, Jiang insisted to keep his end of the bargain. He made a deal for his life, and he was going to stick with it, at least for now. Plenty of haggling still needed to be done in Xi'an between the KMT and CCP in this new arrangement. This dragged on into 1937. In March, Zhou flew back to Yan'an to hold talks with Mao. Nothing much was happening as far as progress. Jiang was insisting the Red Army be under his control, you know, with the new arrangement. And Mao was saying, no way. Things kept dragging on until 7-7-1937. 
the Marco Polo Bridge incident mentioned many times in this podcast. The Japanese launched their offensive, and now times were too urgent to keep bargaining about who would control what. 45,000 troops under the Red Army were organized into the 8th Route Army, the legendary Balu Chin. They operated under nationalist control and wore nationalist uniforms, but Mao ultimately called the shots. They were led by Zhu De and Peng De Huai. Those communist troops operating the central part of China were reorganized into the new 4th Army, led by Ye Ting and Xiang Ying. By September 22, 1937, the CCP and KMT united as one, in spirit anyway, faced a Japanese military that was at the height of its power and with the most memorable atrocities of the war to be committed merely a few months away. Things didn't go too smoothly, though. Just because all these grandiose pronouncements were made at the topmost level, problems remained with the implementation. Joe negotiated on and on with the nationalist side about every little thing. Then in November of 1937, Wang Ming showed up in Yan'an after a long stretch in Moscow. You recall Wang Ming, the head of the 28 Bolsheviks, Stalin's main man as far as China was concerned. Mao still had to deal with this guy, and his return to the main camp presented a clear and present danger to the future great helmsman. In all these discussions at the highest level of the CCP, Wang Ming was leading the charge against Mao's reluctance to cooperate more with the nationalists. Jiang wanted control of these newly assembled 8th Route and New 4th Armies, and Mao was dead set against this. These were his babies. They would fight the Japanese Mao-style, pure guerrilla warfare. In times like this, it was always left up to Zhou to reconcile the two opposites and find the common ground, and done usually in a way where face was preserved and no one was seen giving in. And while all these discussions are going on, let me tell you, quite a bit happening in the world. Pearl Harbor, Japan's sweep into Southeast Asia, the merciless bombing campaign, the Nanjing Massacre. If you recall from past CHB episodes, after the Nanjing Massacre and after the Japanese grabbed that city for their own purposes, the nationalist government moved to the city of Wuhan. But that's not going to last long. And in October 1938, the capital gets moved again further west to the city of Chongqing. And part of the deal Jiang struck regarding the United Front was that the communists could have a representative to serve as a kind of liaison with this central government operating during wartime in this provisional capital. That, of course, was Zhou's role. This will begin yet another major chapter in Zhou Enlai's life. This will be the role he plays representing the communists in the wartime capital of Chongqing. Zhou arrived in town in December 1938. Also going on at this time was the arrival of Lan Ping in Yan'an. She swept into town in August, right after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, and after the Japanese put the movie business in Shanghai on a temporary hiatus. She caught Mao's eye. And amidst all this tumult in China and around the world, they began their famous romance. Later on, she ditches the name Lan Ping and is given the new name, Jiang Qing. So, Zhou became the CCP liaison to the nationalist government with the rank of lieutenant general, first in Wuhan. Zhou doesn't waste any time secretly setting up a Yangtze bureau of the Central Committee of the CCP as well. If he was going to be down in Wuhan where all the action was, he might as well moonlight for the party. It was like the Wampoa Military Academy all over again. One of the first things Zhou got up and running was the Xinhua Bao, the new China Daily. Zhou was tireless in the way he reached out to the intelligentsia and technocrats, people who weren't with him but also weren't against him. Zhou sought to win this huge and important base over to the CCP side. March, April 1938 was the Taiar Zhuang campaign. Zhou didn't fight in the front lines, but he participated in the planning and strategy along with Li Zhongren and Bai Chongxi. This battle was the first time since anyone could remember that the Japanese military got a full punch in the stomach. After this unexpected knockdown, the Japanese military didn't seem so invincible anymore. But 1938, there were still seven more years of hell 
ahead of anyone who might live to see the end in 1945. This Wuhan period was a good one for Joe. He was back in his element, organizing, working clandestinely, building relationships, working old relationships, and getting people pumped up. And right about now, 1938 or so, Western journalists and adventurers began showing up in China and came to Wuhan. Nothing was more enjoyable than an evening meeting this communist leader. So charismatic, charming, erudite. To the West, Joe was a walking advertisement for the CCP. If you wanted to visit Yan'an, you had to go through Zhou Enlai. He acted as Mao's foreign minister. If he thought your presence in Yan'an had value, he would arrange your transit. That's how Bai Cho Un, Norman Bethune, made his way up there in 1938. These were the days when Edgar Snow was getting a close-up look, Agnes Smedley, Rui Alley. They all gravitated towards Joe. And these dozens of foreign journalists would hear what Joe had to say about the communists and the big picture. And for the first time ever, the CCP had a viable channel to influence world opinion and get their side of the story out. In early April 1938, Zhang Guotao, as much at loggerheads with Mao as ever, defected to the KMT. Joe rushed in to try and save the day, but he couldn't do anything. He did all he could to reason with Zhang Guotao and cut a deal, but all to no avail. It was quite a political embarrassment for the CCP. When those original 15 CCP members assembled in Shanghai, July 1921, at 76 Xinye Road, Zhang Guotao was there. He was one of them, an original. So to have someone who sat at the table with Mao, Dong Bi Wu, Chen Du Xiao, and others at that moment of inception, that was one hell of a defection. The CCP propaganda department had to work overtime on that one. Once safely ensconced in Chongqing via Changsha and Guilin, Zhou continued his role as the CCP's liaison to the nationalist government. Deng Yingcha was with him. Ye Jianying worked at his side as well during this period. But his more important role was to act as the point man for the CCP, expanding their relationships, spreading positive messages, and winning sympathy wherever possible. Zhou also did whatever he could to recruit new party members. The ranks began to swell. This second united front was proving to be as good for the CCP as the first one. And everywhere Zhou Enlai went, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Dai Li had a pair of eyes on him. They always made it their mission to know where he was at all times. Everyone knew what Joe was doing, and the two armies that were created, the 8th Route and New 4th, they were only meant to be small forces. But by the end of 1939, the Ba Lu Jin was 150,000 strong, and the New 4th Army had swelled to 40,000. It didn't take long before the New 4th Army, technically part of the Nationalists, began to get hassled by Jiang's forces. In July 1939... Joe made one of his trips back to Yan'an. He kept Mao informed of what was going on. On this trip back, Mao made a request of Joe to speak to the cadres of the Central Committee. Joe dutifully carried out this task, and when he mounted his horse to take the 10-kilometer ride to the cadre school, An Rudy fell from his horse, breaking his arm above the elbow. No less a physician than George Hatem himself attended to the future premier. Once Joe was given this first aid by Dr. Ma Hai De, he was taken to Moscow to the top hospital there to have his fracture taken care of. Jiang Kai-shek had lent one of his private planes to take him there. They were able to stabilize his arm, but it always would remain bent at the elbow. He couldn't straighten it out. After this, in any photo you see of Joe, his right arm is always slightly bent. Joe took advantage of his presence in Moscow to meet with leaders there to discuss the state of affairs between their organization and the Comintern. After long meetings lasting days, Joe was able to bring the Comintern over to his side, that is, the side of Mao Zedong. Joe had used his ways to sway their opinions and win their support. For all these years, it had always been the Comintern bossing around the Chinese communists. Now, thanks to Zhou Enlai, they were in lockstep. This meant that Wang Ming was out, and now he was going to get his. He had been a thorn in Mao's side for a long time. 
with this latest turn of events, it was soon going to be open season on this one-time leader of the 28 Bolsheviks and his cohorts. When Zhou returned to China in March 1940, he had a lot of good news for Mao. In June, he was back in Chongqing. By August, the Red Army was planning some major offensives against Japan and North China. This became known as Peng De Huai's 100 Regiments Campaign. As mentioned in a previous CHP episode, so successful was this 100 Regiments Campaign in killing and harassing Japanese soldiers that it resulted in unexpected retaliatory measures. Jiang saw the success of the Eighth Road Army beating back the Japanese, and this made him very nervous. He negotiated with Zhou for the withdrawal of the new Fourth Army from south of the Yangtze, Jiang's main power base. In December, over 60,000 troops of the new Fourth Army had left, with 10,000 troops remaining behind but planning to cross the Yangtze soon. They were led by Ye Ting and Xiang Ying. On January 7, 1941, the new Fourth Army incident went down. Like everything, there's a KMT version of events and a CCP version. Whatever the case may have been, around 9,000 new Fourth Army troops were massacred by Jiang's army of 80,000, led by Shang Guan Yunxiang. So much for that second united front. Jiang demanded the new Fourth Army disbanded. Instead, Mao had it reorganized, with Chen Yi commanding and Liu Shaoqi acting as commissar. In 1941, December, the USA entered the war, and finally, the matter of China and Chiang Kai-shek got prioritized. But if you remember from many past episodes, the USA didn't want to hear anything about anything that had to do with any civil war. If USA and support was going to keep flowing with any regularity, Jiang had to keep up this sham united front with the communists. Stalin had signed a neutrality pact with Japan that allowed him to focus his military efforts on the Western Front against Hitler. With Stalin thoroughly distracted, Mao launched a rectification campaign in Yan'an. Mao's objective was to clean house of anyone who wasn't on his side, or even suspected of not being on his side. About 10,000 lives were lost, or shall I say taken away. Top on the list were any 28 Bolshevik remnants and supporters of the old Comintern line. Mao also went after anyone who spent time overseas. Joe fell into this category. When he returns to Yan'an, he's going to have to face the music. This Yan'an rectification movement, the Yan'an Zhengfeng Yundong, is where Mao became the unchallenged top leader in the party. He had been heading in this direction since Zunyi, but... When this Yundong was all done in 1944, Mao had no challengers, and Mao Zedong thought had been enshrined in the party constitution. Next time we convene, we'll pick up in July of 1943. Sir Paul McCartney was 13 months old then. This is when Zhou Enlai pulled into Yan'an with this rectification movement raging. All for next time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off once again from the city of Los Angeles. Joe and Lai, part four next time. Please, find the time in your media diet for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.